Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you brought some uh, or you got some coffee because we will take a deep dive into tree shaking. Um, when I told my uh, friends and family about tree shaking, they thought like, ah, are you actually going to shake a tree on a podium or uh, talk about gardening or something? Uh, but it, is, it isn't. Um, I'm Eric Venis. I'm uh, from the Netherlands. I'm a senior front-end engineer at NADOP. And I'm also the creator of Lucid. It's an open source icon library. Uh, we started in 2019. We now have over 29, uh, 1,400 icons. And we have created uh, several packages for a lot of uh, different front-end frameworks. Uh, most of the packages I wrote and when I started with uh, writing packages for Lucid, uh, from the beginning it was clear to me that all these packages needed to be fully tree shakeable. And that's because if you have building a web application where you maybe use 20 icons or, or something and start bundling your application, you shouldn't include all or 1400 icons. So that's tree shaking. So what is tree shaking? Tree shaking is a form of dead code elimination. It's a part of the build process and it's performed by the most popular bundlers like Webpack, Feed, Rollup and Parcel. Rollup is actually used in Feed and Rollup is also the bundler that started making tree shaking popular. So why tree shaking? Uh, it removes unused uh, modules uh, and that reduces your bundle size, improves your load speed and also improves your, of can help improve your uh, core web vitals as well. So if we talk about uh, load speed, uh, loading 170 kilobytes of JavaScript is not really the same as loading an image of 170 kilobytes. Because when you're loading, it's also it's script files also compiled and parsed and executed. So in, in reducing your bundle size also improves this load speeds of, of uh, compiling and parsing. So how does it work? You can just run npm rebuild and it does everything for you. <laughs> uh, it kind of is. Uh, most uh, bundlers uh, try to uh, perform tree shaking out of the box but there are, there are some things you need to take uh, in mind. So how does the bundling process work? So we can look at the bundling process in sort of three phases, where you have the initialize phase, the build phase, and the generate phase. And during the build phase is where tree shaking is happening. So if we look at this typical front-end file tree, you have your main TS file, and in the top you have a reference to another file, for example, an app TS file, or your router, or your state management, and that file has also a reference to another file, and so on, and so on. If you have, an, for example, a file with a couple of functions, and every time when you put the word export before it, you're basically creating a new module within the file. So if we look back, at the file tree again, we have a sort of file tree with multiple modules. So, a sort of file tree. If you tilt your head like 90 degrees, you kind of see like a tree as well, right? <laughs> so, if you have another file where you have an import from a module from another file, for example, this add function, um, and what tree shaking does during bundle time, it analyzes your file, and if you don't use the other modules in that other file, it recognizes it and it will not include those modules during build time. And that's what we call tree shaking. So if we look back at the bundle flow again, we have the initialize phase, the build phase, and generate phase. During the initialize phase, your build config will be loaded. It will validate your plugin, inject some uh, your plugins, your resolve your entry files, and then it starts building. So it reads your entry file, your main TS file, and then it's resolving your other module you imported. It creates it, builds it, parses it, and then it will add those dependencies. And 
it will process and analyze those dependencies and that will it's a sort of recursive process and that's where tree shaking is happening so at the end we have a sort of module tree and then in the generate phase it will create a chunk graph it will create your bundle files etc etc and at the end you have your build project so set up your tree shaking Um, there are some things you need that are required to ma make tree shaking work. Uh, one of the things is you, you need to use the ES module syntax. So don't use require, but you need to use the import syntax. And I hope nowadays that everyone who is building web applications uses now the import syntax. Other thing is side effects. Uh, you need to make sure uh, that you know if you have side effects in your project. So you can look at it in a way that you have two kind of modules. You have impure modules and pure modules. A pure module uh, has code what is within their scope. And if you have an impure module, it has a sort of dependency from an external source. For example, you're uh, declaring some properties on a window object, for example, then the bundler can detect that and it sees there's, there are some side effects. And to make sure everything will work, some compilers will like say, okay, we don't do tree shaking because there are some side effects. So you need to make sure that you have side effects or not. And to, what you can do is that you can declare your side effects in your package.json file. During build time, your bundler will read out your package.js file. It sees this side effects property, and it will make sure this file will be included in a way that side effects won't happen, and all the other files you have in your bundle will be tree shaken. And if you are sure you don't have side effects, you can put it on files. But you need to be 100% sure, otherwise it maybe will tree shake some things that you won't want to be tree shaken. So, writing tree shakeable code. This part is a bit more like um, that we maximize tree shaking in a way that your, your code is tree shakeable as possible by writing your code as modular as possible. So, for example, we have the typical React card component where we have a header, a body, and a footer. And maybe we never use the footer part of this card component. But every time when you bundle your card component, you always include this part of, of, of your footer component. And this is maybe a small footprint of code, and you can think like, yeah, we can just remove it, right? But if, imagine you have a larger code base where you have multiple kind of these components where you have that code. Every time when you bundle this, you will include this dead code. So to fix this, we can also split up this component into smaller components. And because we place the word expert before it, we basically creating multiple modules and this can be tree shaken. So another thing what you can do in React is uh, putting components subcomponents on a main component. This is sort of JSX uh, no, dot notation. But is this tree shakeable? No, it isn't. That's because you're declaring properties on a main component and objects are, are unfortunately not tree shakeable. Um, other thing is using import all from a file, all modules from a file. You can use the import asterisk as for an object, for example. And what it basically creates is a new object with full of modules. But the compiler can't detect which modules you are using with this object. So it will always include everything. So you need to be make sure that you know what you are doing, otherwise you will include all the modules from that file. Other thing you need to watch out for is importing large static objects. For example, this is an object including all tailwind colors, for example. But what you maybe don't know is that when you're importing maybe one or four or eight colors, for example, to make a, a color picker, for example, 
you always include all the other information what is inside this object. Because objects aren't tree shakeable. So instead what you maybe can better do is like cherry pick some uh, colors from this large object. And this is basically the same when you're importing a JSON file. Because when you're importing a JSON file, it all is also one giant object. So it won't know which property are you specifically importing. So in this case, one may maybe have a version of your package JSON file, but what you maybe don't know is that you always include other information in this JSON file where you have maybe some uh, dependency information as well, and that will be included in your bundle file as well. I don't know if you want that. So instead, you can maybe better use an environment variable for this. And this you can declare in your uh, bundle uh, config file, and so in this way it will search and replace. Other thing is using classes. Um, I recommend to use classes only for object-oriented programming and not for just static functions. That's because if you maybe use one or two functions of this class and you start bu building your application, it won't recognize which, which functions aren't used or, or are. So this is maybe a bit silly example, but what maybe is a more common way is like creating a client class where you have full of static functions like your get, your post, put and delete functions. But if you maybe use one or two functions from this class, the other functions always will be included in your bundle file. So to fix this, what you maybe better can do is uh, create splitting up it is in separate modules functions. So in this way we have we put export word before it and every time if you maybe use one or two functions uh, you don't include the rest of the functions because it is tree shakeable. So the next part is a form generator component. Uh, and this is a bit a bit hard to explain but imagine you have a large uh, web application where you have a form generator component. It has all the form input elements, so you can put, give them a config and it will uh, ge generate a form based on the config you've given. But when you start building your application, you will always include all the input elements that's available in that form generator. So what we can do is using dependency injection, and that's a sort of code pattern, where you can inject certain form input elements throughout your larger form generator component. And what's a great library that's using dependency injection really well is floating UI. And this is a library where you can build floating UI objects, uh, for example, a floating drop-down menu or a tooltip. And this is also used by very popular component libraries as well for positioning uh, those floating UI elements. And what they have, they have this use floating functions function where they have some options to position, but they also have a property to pass middleware. <laughs> and what's great about this is you can use floating UI in its minimal form where you're building something, but if you want to extend it with some advanced features like a flip or an an error you want to position sort of sort of something, you can just import certain middleware and declare it in this middleware. And what's great is that it can all be tree shaken because it all are separate modules. So next part is a bit, uh, yeah, I didn't know how to give this section, but there are some things good to know. And that's you need to check your NPM packages. Some some packages are still not reshakeable these days. And one of the popular ones is Axios. It is maybe a, a small library and it's a great library as well, but they are still using common JS. Yes. Uh, Moment JS yes is also one that's still a bit outdated. It's also in maintenance mode. There are currently, I think, a lot of better alternatives right now. And you also have Lodash. And Lodash is an a library that's also written in common JS. Yes. You can imp import certain modules 
specifically, but they also have uh, Lotus ES, and that's fully uh, of uh, ES modules. Um, other thing is to improve your, to analyze, for example, your web application, you can use a bundle analyzer or visualizer. For feed and rollup, you have rollup plugin visualizer, and for web app, you have web app bundle analyzer. And what this does is it's generating on build time a sort of in HTML index file where you can uh, search throughout a tree of yeah, what kind of modules you have imported in your bundle. It's, it's a very nice way to detect if uh, certain things are tree shaken or not. So, covering up, uh, tree shaking is not magically done. Code needs to be written in ES modules. You need to watch out for side effects uh, and write your code as modular as possible and check your NPM packages and use your bundle analyzer to check your output. So, happy tree shaking and thank you very much. If you have questions, reach out to me on uh, GitHub, Discord, and X. Thank you.